We're going to be in Acts chapter 9 this morning. If you remember, I left the phone down on the pew last week and asked for feedback on whether we liked that view of the pulpit during the sermon better or worse. I didn't get any votes one way or the other, but when I watched it, I'm short and all you could see was this knob of the microphone. So for some of you that may have influenced your vote one way or the other, that I was hidden from you behind the microphone. Uh, so far in our study of Acts, we've noticed the Holy Spirit sanctioning the apostles in particular. Uh, there's no surprise there. Jesus had promised them that. He told them to stay in Jerusalem until the promise came. So when the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles and they began to speak in languages they never learned, that's just a given. Jesus had already promised that. Later on in the same day, you had Jews and converts to Judaism who were there for Pentecost, who were baptized into Christ. So we have about 3,000 people on that day. And they are also sanctioned by the Spirit. Peter says, if you'll repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, later on, Philip goes to Samaria. And of course, at least in the minds of the Jewish Christians, there would have been that question, are we going to allow the Samaritans to be part of this? But after the Samaritans were baptized into Christ, Peter and John went down to Samaria and laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on that group. And we've even seen the specific calling, and I mean an angel sends Philip to the road and the Holy Spirit says, go talk to that guy for the conversion of an emasculated man from over 2,000 miles away. So the Ethiopian eunuch, is he part of the deal? Well, the Holy Spirit sends Philip specifically to teach him. But at least all of those people were on our side. This morning, we're going to talk about the question, can God use a man who hates the church to change history in the favor of the church throughout all the generations till the Lord comes back? And the people of his era, the people of his generation would have resoundingly said, no, probably not, not that guy. He's just too far gone. He's too anti-church to be part of what God is trying to get done in the world. So today we're going to talk about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. But as we go through, you'll notice that I rarely call him Saul. I'm just so used to calling him Paul. So if I say Paul and I mean Saul, you know who I'm talking about. So we're going to start in chapter 9 and verse 1. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Uh, how many folks would have voted for Paul to become a member of the church or to be uh, inhabited by the Spirit of God while he was on his way to Damascus? If you had asked the entire congregation at Jerusalem, do you want this guy on your team? Nobody. Right? He was still breathing out murderous threats. It wasn't just that he was going about quietly arresting Christians. He was breathing out murderous threats. He didn't like us. He didn't like the fact that we existed. He wanted us to stop existing and he was going to persecute us out of existence if he could get it done. And the whole reason for his trip to Damascus was that he had heard that some of the Christians who had been converted in Jerusalem had moved up to that area of the world and he was going there to stop the flow of Christianity before it could get too far. 
I would not have imagined if I was one of them that Paul would become one of the greatest leaders in the Christian movement. Let's keep reading, beginning in verse 7. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all of those who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, to their kings, and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this is the first account of the conversion of Paul in Scripture. There are actually three more, all of them from Paul. You can find them in Acts 22, Acts 26, and in Galatians chapter 2. So I have a little printout down here on the front pew, if you'd like to do a deep dive into that, that tells what each one of those accounts has listed, so you can get kind of a full picture of all the things that happened in this time frame, a little bit about Ananias, a little bit more information about his interview with the Lord, like in particular that the Lord was speaking to him in Aramaic. So when it says that the voice from heaven talked to him, he was speaking in the native language of the Hebrew people in Aramaic. Uh, again, if we were giving a roll call, would Ananias have voted yes? Ananias knew about this guy. He'd heard the rumors about Paul. He would have resoundingly said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with him. In fact, he tells the Lord, Lord, I've heard of him. I don't think this is a good idea. Maybe this is, is something that you ought to rethink. Ananias is counseling God against the calling of the apostle Paul. Ananias is a Christian. He's indwelled by the spirit, one would assume. And he's called for a special assignment, but he doesn't see it as being a great honor. I personally have been preaching for 40 some odd years. I've never had the Lord verbally tell me anything. I've never had a special assignment. I've never had the Lord say, I've got a person over here and I need you personally to go take care of this. Ananias did. Did Ananias want the job? No, he didn't seem very honored that the Lord had called him. And I, I hadn't really noticed the verbiage until yesterday I was reading back over this. And it says that I have told him, or he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming to talk to him. So it's not like it could just be some random guy from Damascus that's going to go talk to Paul. Uh, the vision has already clued him in that the guy that's coming to see him is named Ananias. Now, I don't know how many Christians there were in Damascus named Ananias, but uh, the Lord kind of pointed the finger right at him and said, I have chosen this man to be an instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. We don't get all that information in this passage. We don't get uh, God and Paul talking it out, perhaps for another three years prior to he really beginning his ministry he visits with the Lord. He learns more about the message and the mission that he has. But it's not going to be an easy road for the Apostle Paul for a lot of reasons. And so God sends Ananias to get him started. But God wants Paul to know that life is not going to be simple as he is working for the kingdom. Uh, look at verse 17. Ananias went to the house and he entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, 
He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, that is Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, and he was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So a couple of interesting things. You've got a non-apostle sent to act as a conduit for a miracle and for the delivery of the Holy Spirit. And I know I've mentioned this to you before. Uh, I grew up with the firm belief that there was no way anybody that wasn't an apostle could lay hands on somebody and give them the Holy Spirit. Right? Simon the sorcerer noticed this in Samaria. When Peter and John came down and laid hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit, Simon said, I would like to buy that. Can you teach me how to do that so that when I lay my hands on someone that they can receive the Holy Spirit? And he's reprimanded and called to prayer and repentance for acting like that, for thinking that the Holy Spirit could just be easily bought and sold. But here we have a guy who is not an apostle. One would assume that he has the Holy Spirit himself, but his job is to be a conduit. His job is to go and to lay hands on Paul so that Paul can be healed and receive the Holy Spirit. I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, Paul is going to be a great ambassador for the church. And number two, Ananias needs to know that the Holy Spirit is in on this thing. He's already had a vision. He's already been told by God to go do this. But the Holy Spirit is putting his stamp of approval on individuals and on groups of individuals all through this first part of Acts. And it tells us who's in and who's out. So when Ananias lays his hands on Paul and his vision is restored and he receives the Holy Spirit, it says to Ananias, this man is acceptable. Even what he's done in the past is in the past. His opposition to the church is going to change into a great patronage for the church, that he's going to give everything he has, even his own life, for the church and for the Lord. And the Holy Spirit, his presence shows that, not just to us 2,000 years later, but to Ananias, who was sent to help someone that most folks would have voted no to come into the kingdom. Let's look over to Acts chapter 22. This is one of those other uh, records. And uh, as I mentioned, the other three accounts are all from Paul himself. This one is Luke's account of what happened to Paul. Uh, in Acts 22, we have an account of what Paul says happened to Paul. Lots of similarities, a couple of other things that Luke did not mention. But chapter 22, verse 12 Chapter 22, verse 12. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and what you have heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 15. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Do you remember Jesus telling the twelve? Right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now Ananias is telling Paul, you're going to be his witness to all the people. And when he says all the people, he's not talking about the Jewish realm. He's talking about all the people of the world, the nations, the outsiders, the faraway people. 
So as when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, part of that load will fall on the Apostle Paul. But I want to take a quick look at something Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that is sometimes misunderstood. And I just want to leave it with you, let you ruminate on it. But it begins in chapter 10, and I'm going to start reading in verse 8. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now compare that back to what Ananias said to Paul in the first place. What are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So just as we talked about with the Ethiopian eunuch, whatever it was that Philip taught him out of Isaiah 53, he eventually got around to the subject of being baptized into Christ. Why else would the eunuch have said, well, look, there's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? When Ananias tells Paul that he needs to be baptized, he tells him the same thing the apostle said on the day of Pentecost. You need to be baptized to wash away your sins. And in that way, you will be calling on the name of the Lord. So with our hearts, we believe. With our mouths, we confess. But baptism is a part of that process. And it was a part of that process in the life of the Apostle Paul. Right? Let's go one step farther. Look at Acts chapter 9 again, and we'll start back in verse 23. Acts chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 23. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, that is the Jews at Damascus. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. By the way, I mention this from time to time. I've got to keep reminding you because it's so important. Um, when you make handouts for little kids, a string with something on the front is one of the best things you could possibly have because you could put Jesus on the earth and you could pull the back of the string and he ascends into the heavens, right? You can put uh, Eutychus on the the top and and he falls out the window. Well, here you could take Paul and take him up and he can escape out the, the hole in the wall. Anyway, just if you just make one little take home, it, it covers a, a multitude of lessons for little kids. So remember where you heard it. When he went to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Even after he's had the meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus, even after he's been baptized by Ananias, has the Holy Spirit at work in his life, even after he's doing such a good job in Damascus preaching and teaching that they run him out of town, he gets to Jerusalem and the Christians in Jerusalem say, we're not really sure. We don't believe that he's really a converted Christian. Imagine what you might have thought if you were them. He's just trying to infiltrate us. Right? If he keeps saying, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, and then we say, well, yeah, me too. And then he says, oh, gotcha. Let me take you to the authorities. Let me tie you up and turn you in. They were afraid that Paul wasn't really who Paul said he was. So we get introduced again to Barnabas. Verse 27, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. 
He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers heard about it, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. But the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and they were strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So we get another roll call passage from Luke. He wants us to know that now that Paul has been sidelined, he's no longer persecuting the church. There's a time of peace in Jerusalem. But during that time when he was persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem, what did it do? It increased the size and the scope of the kingdom. People moved up that coastline and they were preaching as they went. Paul becomes a member of the church. He defends the gospel in the north. And now he has moved back to his hometown of Tarsus, which is where we'll find him later on as he begins his formal ministry. But again, I ask you, would you have voted yes? If we had been together as a group in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit says, guess what? Saul of Tarsus is going to be our newest member. He's going to start worshiping with you guys. He's going to be preaching around town. You guys give him your support. How many would have said, absolutely. If God says it, I believe it. And that settles it. And how many would have just been afraid as Ananias was afraid, as the Christians at Jerusalem were afraid. Now, I want to remind you, that's the reason I think this book should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, not the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles didn't know everything. The apostles couldn't do everything, but the Holy Spirit always gets it right. So as the apostle Paul comes on board and begins his work in the kingdom, the Holy Spirit again is proved right in what he does. So we've got complete, total Jews, and Paul is one of those. He was born a Jew. We've got people who have been converted to Judaism who are now in the kingdom. We have Samaritans, half-breed Jews, who are now in the kingdom. We have a fellow from Ethiopia, 2,500 miles away, who's now in the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit just keeps pointing to this one and this one and this group and this group and saying everyone is welcome in the kingdom. So Lord willing, next week, we'll look at one of the biggest ones, and that is Cornelius. When a full-blooded, non-Jew, non-converted Jew, just a Gentile, actually comes into the kingdom of the Lord, changes everything for you and for me.